In this clarification, let's talk about ion exchange chromatography. Like all other types of chromatography, we have a mobile phase, a stationary phase, and the, the mixture that we wanted to separate and to fractionate in the individual components. In the case of ion exchange chromatography, we are dealing with peptides and proteins, so our mobile phase is a buffer. And the pH of the buffer is very important because it dictates uh, the overall charge of the proteins. So the proteins are glowed on the column, and the mobile phase is going to pass it through the column. And then the materials that are not binded to the column is going to pass it through directly to the column without any retention. Those are the pass-through material. Then the material that have the opposite charge of the columns are going to bind to the column, and the ones that bind more tightly is going to reside in the column for longer. It's going to be more difficult to remove them from the column. Those that bind loosely are going to be removed more quickly. So we separate by proteins that do not bind at all, proteins that bind weakly, and the proteins that bind more tightly. In this animation, this principle is illustrated by having uh, compounds of different colors uh, that are being separated. The green compound is not retained, therefore it's passed through the column, and then the orange compound is less retained, and finally the blue compound that's the most retained of all the compounds that have been separated. In this example here that we discuss in class is an example of a cation exchange chromatography. Uh, the stationary phase is formed of particles that are negatively charged. So the proteins that are negatively charged are not going to bind to this column, it's going to pass it through. Examples of proteins are depicted here, uh, one in the red color. Uh, this protein has a large net negative charge, so therefore it's not going to bind at all. Same thing for uh, this protein here in yellow, which also has a negative charge. So the proteins that are going to bind are the proteins that have a positive charge at the pH of the mobile phase. In this case in here, the two proteins depicted in blue and the cyano. Uh, so the one that they are having a larger net positive charge is going to be binding more tightly to the column. Therefore, it needs more salty concentration to elude the end from the column. Uh, therefore, this protein depicted in cyan again is going to be coming before the protein that's depicted here in blue. Because of the retention time is related to the tightness of the binding of the protein with the stationary phase. So, depending on the protein that you are analyzed, we may want to elect to use a uh, positively charged uh, stationary phase. In that case, we are going to have a, an ion exchange chromatography. Or, if your protein is positively charged, we can uh, use a negatively charged stationary phase, so to make sure that your protein binds to it. In that case, we have a cation exchange chromatography, like the first example that we discussed here today. Let's say now that we have two proteins and both of them are, have an overall negative charge. One of them has more charge than the other one. So we are going to use for that case a stationary phase uh, that is positively charged. So we are going to use a, an ion exchange chromatography. By contrast, if you have a protein that's positively charged, the overall net charge of the protein is positive, then we are going to select a column that is negatively charged, uh, so that's going to be a case of cation exchange chromatography. Whether your protein is positively charged or negatively charged all depends on the pH of this uh, buffer. Uh, if the pH is above the pi of the protein, then the protein is going to be negatively charged. By contrast, if the pH is below the pi of the protein, uh, the protein is going to be negatively charged. So you can uh, manipulate the pA of the buffer and select the stationary phase according to your knowledge of the pi of the protein. Uh, protein, again, that's negatively charged 
we are going to use a stationary phase that's positively charged. In the protein that's positively charged, we are going to use a stationary phase that's negatively charged in order for them to bind. Unless we don't want the protein to bind to the stationary phase, which we can discuss about that later. Let's say now that we have three proteins, A, B, and C. Two of them are negatively charged and one of them is positively charged. You want to separate these proteins. Let's say that you want to separate the protein C. Protein C is positively charged. So in that case, when you use a, a stationary phase that's negatively charged, because C and the stationary phase would bind. So your protein would be retained, and the protein A and the B would pass through, you would be separate from protein C, which is your target. However, if your target is to separate the protein A or B, then we can have a different strategy. Uh, now, we are going to use a positively charged stationary phase. So in that particular case, protein C is no longer binding. It's going to pass through the column without any binding. So you already get, got rid of protein C. Now, both protein A and B are retained on the column, and it ne now you want to separate them. First step, we got rid of protein C. Now, you have another job that's separate A from B. So in that case, uh, A is more uh, tightly bind to the stationary phase, phase than uh, the protein B, because it, A has an overall net negative charge uh, larger than protein B. So we're going to add the salt concentration. Depicted here in this black are going to be the salt concentration, the chloride. So we're going to add the chloride concentration and we are going to be increasing. And because of the sheer numbers of chloride ions inside of the, the, the column, it's going to compete with the uh, proteins that are bound there, and obviously the first protein to be removed is the protein that has the less tight binding, which in that case would be the protein B. So we would have them remove protein B, and if you are lucky enough, you maybe want to remove all protein B before the protein C A start leaving the column. So we have C was already gone out of the picture by the flow through process. Now we have A and B. And as we put the salt concentration, B would leave first, and C would, uh, and A would leave later because A is uh, tightly bind to the column, so would reside for a longer period of time. So in the column now, instead of having A and B bind to the column, the column now is going to have chloride bound to it. Uh, as we as we said. Uh, the protein C was already passing as a flow through, and now protein A and B would, be going, would be bound to the column, and it's competing with this chloride, and because the chloride comes in sheer numbers, they are going to be uh, winning this competition and they kick off the protein out of the column. So at the end, we are going to have uh, these different tubes, and the first tube that you collect the sample is the sample that pass through, in this case the sample C, uh, which is depicted here on the left, and then uh, as the thing goes, we are going to have coming off first the protein B and finally the protein A. If you put that in a chromatogram that we are going to see on the instrument, we are going to see three different peaks. We're going to see the first peak that comes off and as you see here, we are looking, using absorbance with UV light to detect those compounds based on the fact that some of this protein might have a, at least one uh, tryptophan, and that's going to be good enough for detection of the protein by UV. So the protein that was not retained is the first one to come out, less residence time inside of the column, shorter, uh, retention time in the chromatogram. Then protein B was retained by the column, but with the salt concentration that we start increase, uh, and we see here, first we have no salt concentration, then we start increasing the salt concentration, uh, so that is going to be 
uh, releasing the proteins that they are bound. Because B was bound less tightly, it is released first, and then A was more tightly bound, needs a higher concentration of sodium to be able to remove that protein. So the three proteins are going to be released, C, B, and A, in that order of the increasing retention time. I hope that's crystal clear now, this issue of ion exchange chromatography.